to your current practices. And then I want to review some kind of basic practical aspects of cone beam CT, whether or not this is something that you think you can afford to have in your practice, whether or not this is something that is going to be easy enough for you to incorporate into your daily routine, or if this is going to be something that you feel is too cumbersome for you and kind of ways and approaches that you might be able to take to get around those hurdles and obstacles. Then I want to kind of go through a simple systematic approach, how I review scans. And so we'll go over some scans and I'm hoping that everyone has the opportunity to start to visualize what you're starting to see when you're reviewing these CBCT scans. Because as with anything, you don't want to have the equipment, offer the diagnostic modality to people when you're not quite sure exactly what you're doing with the results and, and the information in front of you. So um, it takes a little bit of time to become familiar with what you see on CT. And that's something that I did go through when I was first learning all of this. And that's certainly a, a learning curve that, that happens when you start to go through these. So the hope is that you at least can become familiar with when you look at a, a screen and you start to see things, what it is that you're seeing, being able to identify some normal and abnormal um, pathology and anatomy there. So what is cone beam CT? You have an x-ray source on one side and then a flat detector on the other side. What happens is there's one rotation that goes around the patient that acquires hundreds of projections and that number can vary. There is a field of view, and you're going to hear that kind of term tossed around a lot, the field of view. And it's relatively large field of view for veterinary medicine because we want to be able to position our patients in a way that we can collect the information that's needed. So it's a little bit larger um, field of view than you might need for something really specific, maybe an ENT or a dentist on the human side. Then we're going to look at the voxel size, and in a very, very simplistic way of explaining that, it's essentially a pixel that's kind of in 3D. So voxel size is something that manufacturers kind of throw out there um, as a number and a selling point and a, and a thing to talk about. It, you can go into smaller sizes. But as you're kind of cutting that cube into more and more pieces, it doesn't necessarily provide additional information. So that's just something to know and keep in mind. And then, of course, when you're looking at any kind of 3D imaging, you're going to be able to see it in multiple planes so that you can put everything together. And then you can also view it as a 3D reconstruction. So what's really nice about cone beam CT, particularly this unit, is that you can actually manipulate the positioning in three dimensions after your scan has been taken. And that's not necessarily the case, for instance, with your regular CT scans. So it, positioning is very important for those. And when we are doing cone beam CT, we can actually alter each um, image and each plane that we're evaluating, and I'll show you how to do that um, once we get to review of the scans. So a little bit about combing CT versus intraoral radiographs and when you might want to consider using this. So when we're looking at bone thickness, we're looking at an or intraoral radiograph that might be showing us what's going on, but we're looking at it in two dimensions. So we can't necessarily see what kind of bone thickness we have. And that becomes important when we are trying to evaluate our extractions, our fractures, all those kind of things. We want to see the periodontal ligament, the width of that. And what's very interesting is you start to see that a lot of our strategic teeth in the mouth, so the canine teeth, and then our carnasal teeth have a relatively wider periodontal ligament space at the apex, and that's normal. You can identify that when you go through scan after scan after scan, and you start to see when we look at our two-dimensional intraoral radiographs and we're seeing this chevron sign, we start to look at our three-dimensional comb beam CT scans, and we can actually see that space and identify that on our scans. So it's going to be really important to, to identify apical periodontitis. 
and um, you guys can go through, I'm not going to go through and in a very academic way, go through every single article that I've read about cone beam CT because you all have access to those articles as well. And if anyone would like a list of references that I have uh, from this presentation or kind of in general, I'm happy to send that to you. So you can certainly reach out to me and let me know. But uh, you can read the papers on apical periodontitis where you're evaluating uh, the condition with intraoral radiographs versus cone beam CT. Also looking at vertical root fractures, you're going to be able to identify those a lot easier in three dimensions. Of course, our TMJ cases. When you're looking at TMJ on skull films, for instance, or even if you're trying to use your, your size four plates, maybe if you have a phosphor plate system, you're not going to get the kind of imaging that you're going to get looking at anything in 3D. Then especially I've you know, talked to people that have the cone beam CT in practice, and one of the things that they found particularly helpful is these caudal maxillary and mandibular fractures that you may or may not be able to have your dental x-ray sensor or your film all the way in the back of the mouth to determine exactly what's going on. And particularly those fractures where you're trying to determine if this is something where you need to do an invasive procedure versus maybe you just want to do MMF as your, your treatment. So that can help with your treatment plan if you can gather the additional information. Of course, tumor margins are going to be a place where this would be an appropriate thing to use. We can you know, make an image and then potentially do 3D printing of what you're seeing in order to prepare in advance. And you've probably heard about cases of where they've done that. So tumor margins are certainly an area to consider using this. Relationship of roots to the nasal cavity. And then another one that I have there listed is retained tooth roots. So being able to identify where things are and what you're seeing. Let's say you have a case that comes to you and you have retained tooth roots from potentially an RDVM that you know wants to just make sure that everything looks okay, but there are some maybe there's something that got pushed into the nasal cavity and, and now you can do this comb beam CT. You can identify exactly where you need to go to, to remove that root. Impacted teeth are another um, particularly important area to be able to identify. You can use anatomical landmarks to determine where you need to perform your surgery in order to remove those. And then of course cysts are another um, pretty big area that you would want to have cone beam CT for. As far as contrast, this is a question that comes up quite a bit. And the question is always, is this something that we can or cannot do? So you're not going to have necessarily the same quality of contrast with cone beam CT as you may have with conventional CT. But you can use contrast successfully with cone beam CT. However, with dentistry, if you are using this primarily um, as a dental specific unit, then you're mostly going to be evaluating the hard tissues. So it's not necessarily a huge issue, but it certainly is something that can be used. So the practicality of cone beam CT. And what I hear from a lot of people is, how am I going to pay for this? Is this something that I really need to have in my practice? Is this something I can afford to have in my practice? Is this something that I need? And I think that, first off, my, my response is, I think that cone beam CT is going to become a staple of veterinary dental practices in the next five to 10 years. And I, and I mean that wholeheartedly, and I am not a salesperson, and I don't work for any of the companies. I just really feel strongly about cone beam CT and the capabilities that it, it gives us to pursue the best treatment options for our patients. So the price depends on how you decide to do it and which company you go with and everything else. So it's going to depend if you decide to buy a unit, if you decide to lease it, if you have a service contract, if, you know, going, which manufacturer you're going through. If you start asking around and talk to people who have cone beam CT, you're going to find that there's a huge range of what people are charging. So people are charging sometimes as low as $300 per scan and sometimes as high as $1,200 per scan. And why that variety and why that difference? Um, some people will have 
routine scans versus scans that they're using for oral tumors or trauma cases. Sometimes you'll have people that are sending cases to you that are just having cone beam CT performed and you're not doing anything else. So if you are in, for instance, a standalone dental uh, practice and somebody wants to have a cone beam scan run on their uh, patient, they may send them over to you. You could run the scan and have the imaging results provided to them and then they come up with their treatment plan. Now, if it's for dentistry, then you're probably not going to be doing just cone beam CT by itself quite as much. So if you're going to lease one of these, it's going to run somewhere around $3,000 a month. And so even if you're only charging $300 per scan, if you did 10 scans in a month, you pay for the machine. Anything past that, you're going to obviously be making money on the machine. I think that there are also ways to incorporate having comb beam CT and not forcing the machine itself to be justifying why you have it in your practice. So keeping in mind always that our intent is to provide the best quality of care as we can to our patients. And if we can do that and be able to provide these scans and gather this information, interpret this information, come up with the best treatment plan. Maybe we can even be more effective in our extractions because we're able to see where roots are located. We're able to use this on a lot of cases, maybe not just our trauma cases and our oral tumors, you know, start using it very routinely. And that would be my ideal setting would be to use this scan charging a lower cost, using it as a complementary modality to intraoral radiographs where you maybe have your staff taking your radiographs or maybe you do your scan first and then you have your staff taking your radiographs while you're interpreting your scan. These scans really only take about 40 seconds to run. So depending on you know, what you have for your practice, you can very easily incorporate this into the routine. So just like with dental x-rays, I just want to say, if you don't recognize normal, you're not going to be able to recognize abnormal. So when I'm teaching at vet clinics, I always recommend to people that they start taking full mouth radiographs on normal, healthy patients that they see instead of just taking radiographs here and there on abnormal anatomy. And I think that we get into the same kind of thing when we're considering whether or not we want to have a cone beam CT in our practice and we say, okay, this is great. I'm going to use this on oral tumor cases and I'm going to use this on my trauma cases and I'm going to use this on these big cases where I have a lot of abnormal things going on. But then what, what justice are we doing to that then when we haven't been also scanning and becoming very familiar with normal? So I just wanted to, to kind of make that point, too, that I think that it's very important to be able to identify normal. And then you can, as soon as you recognize normal and can go through scans quickly, and I can tell you this from my own experience of doing scan after scan after scan, that you can very quickly pick up abnormal. When normal is on your radar, you can very, very quickly pick up abnormalities. So like I say, it's a, it's a very quick scan. Um, most of the Columbia CT units out there are. The nice thing about a vet cat, which is um, the only unit that I personally have used, is that it is a self-shielded unit, so you don't have to have a separate room for your patients. You don't have to put them on a separate cart and wheel them away in order to get these images. It's a portable unit. It can be wheeled to the surgical table. You can run your scan right there. And um, I have a video here to kind of demonstrate just how quick that is. So this is just a quick scan that shows the whole thing start to finish. This is again at the Columbus Zoo. This is a, an image of a wolverine. Whoops. Let me go right back and push play. <laughs> So that little guy has his head just off of the edge of the table. And that is on uh, a little carbon fiber mount. 
And you can see right there that that's how his, his head is kind of off the edge of the table on that mount. And it's very easy to just go ahead and scan that. And then literally within moments of finishing this scan, then we were able to wheel that right away and get started on that little guy's endodontic procedures. So what would it look like if we used it for every case? Would it be something where you could consider you get you, you do the induction, you have your, your patient in a good plane of anesthesia, you run your scan, you take your full mouth rads, you evaluate all of your diagnostics, and then you do your procedure. Is that something that's feasible? And I think that the reality is that's a question that only you can answer for your practice. I think that it's feasible because it really doesn't take that much more time. And the amount of additional information that you are able to gather is incredible. So for instance, if you look at this scan that I have just shown on this slide, you can see this is my absolute favorite tooth in the mouth, um, the mandibular first molar. And you can see exactly where those roots are positioned in relation to the mandibular canal in this patient. And that is an important thing to be able to know, especially when we're getting into cases where we need to do extractions on these guys, or maybe they have something else going on too, and we just want to be aware of, of all of the pathology and the normal anatomy for each patient. So some case selection, you know, endodontic cases, if you read the literature again, you're going to see that this is a fantastic thing to be using when you're doing your root canals and your follow-up for those. Um, that's something that we're planning on doing with that, that little wolverine, most likely, is that there were apical abscesses on that guy, on, on two of those teeth. And so we'll, we'll do follow-up and be able to accurately gauge what those look like in months to come. So perio cases as well, so you're able to see that bone loss, the bone height, where the bone is in three dimensions. We take our radiographs and they're great, but they don't actually tell us where do we still have bone? Where do we not have any bone? Our trauma cases, of course, which is where a lot of people are using this right now. Trauma and tumor cases are some of the most um, common uses for this machine. And then the TMJ cases are also very common, especially in an academic setting. You're going you're gonna to hear the TMJ cases routinely being scanned and seen and evaluated. Malocclusion cases, right? We can look at this and we can see occlusion in these patients. We can see where are these teeth um, causing issues? What might we want to do differently? Brachycephalic. So this is a big one. And you can talk to a lot of people who have cone beam CT, and you can talk to anybody who's done dental x-rays on a brachycephalic, and everyone knows that you cannot accurately identify the exact location of those roots in these patients. But if you have a 3D image of where those roots are located, you're going to be a lot better off. And particularly if there were to be um, a case that came to you that had retained tooth roots, you would be able to identify exactly where those are and more easily approach those, determine your surgical approach a little bit more accurately and better. So anatomic relationships, again, like I, I noted before, just simply the, the location of the mandibular canal, the location of the nasal cavity when we're looking at these tooth roots. Nasal foreign bodies, like I talked about briefly, tooth roots, and then cysts again. So there are plenty of cases where it is appropriate to be incorporating cone beam CT into your daily routine. And is it possible or feasible to use it for every case? Maybe, maybe not. But I think that it's, it's definitely something to throw out there to consider. So what I'd like to do now is go through just a few scans with you guys. I want to cover some identification of normal anatomic relationships, just being able to visualize some of the oral structures, just an approach to what you're seeing, what you're looking at, and just recognizing a little bit of abnormal pathology and um, everything there. So I'm going to switch over. So this is a younger dog. And you can see the three different views here. So what I like to do is start with my transverse or coronal view. And that gives me the ability to see 
everything kind of all at once. So we start to scroll through here, and you can see the incisors, and we start to come back to the canine teeth, and you can see that this is a young dog because there is a wide, relatively wide um, chamber there when we look at this. And you're starting to see normal anatomy and its relationship. And if you look at the other two uh, images there on the screen, you can see that the blue line here and here, as I scroll through this, starts to move as well. So hopefully, and I know this might be a little bit blurry on your screens, and that has to do with the internet connection because it's completely crisp and clear on my screen. So I do apologize. I know that that's one of the limitations of doing it this way, but I think that it's nice for you to be able to see it in real time as I kind of go through here. And then you can start to see we're getting to the apex of those canine teeth on the top and on the bottom. And we're And as we continue to go back, we can see some of those roots have a bit of dilaceration to them. And that can happen actually in three dimensions. And you've probably noticed that as you've extracted these teeth or maybe done root canals on these teeth. And you start to be able to identify the relationship of those tooth roots to that mandibular canal there. And we keep going back and see, and here we're getting to the level of our mandibular molar and our upper fourth premolar here, maxillary fourth premolar. See the occlusion. We can see the position of those roots. And we're able to identify the nasal cavity as we're going through this as well. So I'm just continuing to scroll back here and scan all the way to the back of the head. And you can start to see just how close some of those maxillary roots are to this thin layer of bone. You can identify that there, and hopefully it's not too blurry on your screen. I know I have to go real slow here. But you can see, if we're looking, at this plane, you can see how we have a little bit of a root still here, a visible here, and then also here. We continue to go back and we can identify what's going on and what's happening. And then we continue to scroll back just a little bit further. And we takes us to our level of our TMJ here. So once I've gone through this view, I like to then start and be able to go to my sagittal view. And what I'll do for that is I will start on one side or the other. So you can see that I can move this line here, which allows me to kind of adjust to which side I'm looking at. So I'll kind of start on one side I'll go through this a little bit faster than I did the first one. I like to sh show you and go slowly as I evaluate that first image. And then you can start to scroll through and scan and see. We'll start on the right side of the patient. And you can start to identify all of the structures looking at them from this angle. And you can see the dilaceration of those roots if you look at that um, mandibular second molar there. And the occlusion. And then you can see the apex of each tooth, we continue to scroll through, and we can identify everything all the way through to the other side as well. So then I always go back through and look at my axial view, and I do this last. Um, not that this view doesn't also give important information, but I feel that um, maybe the information is not up up front as helpful as what I'm seeing on my transverse and my sagittal. So then I go to my axial view 
and I will go ahead and start at the bottom and kind of work my way up. And you can see when you get to this level, for instance, when you're looking down on these teeth, this is in the mandible. And you can see your really big mandibular first molar here. And you can see this interproximal groove and just how prominent it is. And that also helps you to identify. And if I go back down just a little bit, you can see just how deep some of those roots go. So we're almost all the way down to um, the ventral aspect of the mandible here, and you can still see those tooth roots. So going back up, we go back up, and we are able to identify that interproximal groove. And you can see that that distal root was on the lingual aspect of M1 on that axial view. And then we're able to identify when we're looking at it this way. This is very helpful. This is especially helpful, for instance, for our brachycephalics, where we're able to identify the maxillary premolars and molar root position. So if you look at this, you can see, and we also have an interproximal groove here, and we have one here. So that's on our distal root of our upper force premolar bilaterally. And you've probably seen that and noticed that in practice, and you're probably aware of that. But you can see just how distinct you can actually visualize that when you're looking at the axial view here. And then we go all the way up and get a nice thorough view of everything. And then you can see here we are able to do a 3D reconstruction. And as far as for diagnostic purposes, it, it's very neat to be able to look at your 3D reconstruction, and there are certainly a lot of instances where this is very helpful, but as far as routine diagnostics, um, the three images and views that you're going to routinely get are going to be the most important thing. So that is that scan. I'd like to um, pull up another one here for you. You can see this is in real time, kind of switching from one scan to the next and how long they take to load. <clears throat> okay, so for as many images as we have here, it really is remarkable how quick we're able to retrieve that data. So again, what I do is I start at the very beginning. That's kind of the frontmost portion of the animal in order to identify my normal. And we start to scroll back. And we want to see if there is anything that is abnormal as we go through this scan. So we've seen where the apices of the canine teeth on the mandible are, and then there on the maxilla. We continue to scroll back. And we're looking at the symmetry between the mandibles here, and we start to see that we have some abnormality there. So on the left side, we see that we actually have some proliferative bone. And then you can also still see there your interproximal groove when you're looking at those mandibular molar teeth. The dilaceration of those roots in three dimensions. Identification of the location of the tooth roots on the maxilla. And then scrolling all the way back. So we'll look at that again in the sagittal plane as well. And what I like to do is start at one side on the right side here, and then I'll scroll all the way through. And we can identify the normal tooth structures, and we can identify right there, you can see kind of a widening of the periodontal ligament space of that maxillary canine tooth, which is normal there. And 
And then we're about at midline, and then we're over to the left side here. And you can start to see that growth of the bone, the abnormality there in the right underneath the first molar, extending caudally. And then we want to just take a look at everything in the axial view as well. So I start at the bottom and scroll through. And we looked at that abnormal bone growth, and then we just start to look at everything else. We want to identify location of the teeth. We want to identify bone loss. We want to identify whether or not we have any kind of fractures. For those trauma cases that are going to be coming to you, you can very easily look at these images and be able to identify those caudal maxillary or caudal mandibular fractures that you're not going to necessarily be able to see on your intraoral radiograph. So I want to show you one last scan here. In this case that I'm pulling up is a, a case that has some periodontal disease. So this is a nice instance where you may want to consider using this more routinely for some of your perio cases or your extraction cases, not just for your trauma and tumor cases. So I always go back to the beginning. And one thing I did want to uh, make sure that I do point out is I mentioned that you can adjust this in after you have done your scan. And that is just like here on the side, you can see how I'm going up and down, and I'm able to manipulate the image in all three views. So I can actually change what I'm looking at and change the positioning in order to, to see things a little bit differently or better, depending on exactly what it is that I want to see. So we started again at the beginning and go caudally here. We can see there's our mandibular molar, our first molar. You can see the anatomy of that tooth. And then we continue to scroll back. And we start to see some significant periodontal disease. And we can see where that bone loss is. And if you're looking particularly right in this area, And you can see the angle of those roots there. So something that's interesting, you know, we take these images as intraoral radiographs and we can see the roots only in two dimensions. And it's fascinating once you start to scroll through scan after scan after scan to identify all of the anatomic variations that we start to see in the tooth roots throughout the mouth. So once I'm through that view, again, the same thing that I did before is that I'm going to start on the right side. And this is what I recommend to anyone is, you know, find your approach and do it the same every single time. It's the same thing that I teach veterinarians and technicians when they're doing any kind of dental procedure. If you do it the same every single time, you're going to just become more familiar with it. You're going to miss less things. You're going to be able to easily and quickly identify abnormal. You can see the periodontal ligament width around that maxillary canine tooth again. And then we start to get to where we have the periodontal disease. And so this looks more similar to what we would see on an intraoral radiograph when we're looking at this image here. And you can zoom in, certainly, and kind of get a feel for what you're looking at. And so that's more similar to what we're used to seeing in two dimensions. But if you remember, when we were looking at that, on our transverse or coronal view, and we can pull this over here so that we can get everything all at the same place. And you can start to see that bone loss in multiple planes. 
and you can get a feel for, and this isn't a hugely significant tooth in the mouth, right? But when you have your more significant teeth in the mouth that are involved in this, it can be particularly important to be able to identify what structures are still intact, what's not, where you have bone loss, where you don't, where the roots that are still there are located, and what you might need to do for your surgical approach. And then, of course, looking at our axial view, again, starting on the ventral border of the mandible, we start to see those tooth roots appear, and we're able to identify location and variation of all of those Looking at normal occlusion when we're in this view, we're able to see where those teeth come together from the mandible and the maxilla. And then we're able to see the location of all of those tooth roots. And this would be, um, and I don't have one to pull, I, I have them, but I'm not going to go through them with you tonight, um, a case of endodontic lesions. Those show up very, very nicely on these axial views where you're able to just see a lucency completely around the roots as well. And so you can just kind of see that's my systematic approach to how I view comb beam CTs and when I'm looking at scans. And after doing hundreds of these, I very quickly became capable of identifying when something is abnormal. Even if I was doing a very quick preliminary scan or scroll through my scan to see if everything was okay and everything looks good, I could very easily identify abnormal findings. Now, if you go back through more thoroughly, you're, of course, going to find more again. But very quickly and easily, once you develop that systematic approach and start to become familiar with normal anatomy and what a normal scan looks like, which is going to take probably somewhere in the range of 30 scans to become familiar with. So depending on how many you're doing and how frequently you're doing them, there is that, that little learning curve in the beginning, uh, which is super beneficial to consider more patients and also some of your normal patients. So this I just wanted to kind of show you um, a little bit. This is actually that the Wolverine that I was talking about earlier. And you can see here um, the apical disease that we actually do have present. And then I put in the radiograph as well so that you could see it. But you can see in three dimensions the extent of that disease, which is fairly significant, that you wouldn't necessarily be able to identify just looking at this radiograph. Though it's a fantastic radiograph, it doesn't necessarily give us the same appreciation for the amount of disease as what the comb beam CT does. So this is that, that same little dude, and this is the mandibular lesion. And you can see here on our radiograph that's present, but you can see it more prominently, and this is, I threw in the normal size as well, so you could, could appreciate that. But you can see it more prominently on comb beam CT than you can on radiographs, for sure. And that's been proven in the literature as well. Like I say, if, if anybody does want a list of articles and references, I'm happy to send them to you. So this is, again, another perio case. Uh, not, not quite the same one, but this is another perio case. You can see the bone loss that we have here and here, and then also up here. So we can start to identify a little bit more significant maxillary bone loss. And something also interesting, when we start to look at the dilaceration of some of these tooth roots, even on our maxillary carnasal teeth. And then this would be another perio case that we're looking at. So you can certainly see we do have a nice radiograph that shows us what's going on, but we're able to see it in three dimensions here. See the significant amount of bone loss that we have. And we're able to kind of identify that a little bit more easily. This is um, in still view, and you can see here the endodontic lesions. So I have them in still view, but I didn't go through them as the scan, like I said. So, but you can appreciate here the lucency that you're able to see present in three dimensions. And you can look at it from every angle to identify where do we have an issue, how much of an issue is this, and is this measurable, is this something that is you know, treatable, how are we going to approach this patient? So 
with that, I will take any questions that you guys have. Um, and again, thank you everyone for attending this evening. Hopefully this was at least somewhat beneficial and gave you a little bit of a feel for whether or not cone beam CT is something that you may consider adding to your practice. So does anybody have any questions? Hi, Dean. This is Mary Hernandez. Hello. Hi, Jamie. It's Mary Hernandez. I have a question um, regarding how many you had to do to get used to using the software. Sure. sure. So and I. Take... Go ahead. No, I was going to say, are you taking these images and doing these care side while your patient is under anesthesia? So um, I have to give the disclaimer that, unfortunately, my answer is no. I wish that I had this. I currently have a mobile practice, so I don't have that ability. If I was in a standalone practice right now, if I was in a veterinary dental referral practice, I would have Combeam CT with me every single day, and I would do these scans with patients under anesthesia every single day. Um, so my scans that I have done were actually for my research, but I would say that it took me about – 20 to 30 scans to become really familiar, very good at, and quickly able to identify what I was looking at. Do you ever send Does that answer scans? the question? Yes, it did. Here's my follow up question Do you ever send sure. scans out to a radiologist for a secondary interpretation? From the cone beam CT scans? Yes. So that's a great question. And the answer is yes, you certainly can. I do work with a couple of boarded radiologists um, and here in Columbus, and they actually didn't know about and unfortunately were not familiar with cone beam CT until I started introducing them to it. So the reality is veterinary radiology is not quite up to speed with exactly what they're looking at when they're identifying and evaluating these images, they're, they're familiar with regular CT. So there is the ability to view things, but because we have such smaller slices and more specific um, data, it's also a larger file that you're sending. So sometimes you're actually not able to send all of the information, but the answer is yes, it certainly can be done. I know of um, a veterinarian down in, in Florida who routinely sends these to radiologists, and I have read many, 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 when David and I were originally doing our training program, um, I read many radiology <laughs> interpretations of comb and CT. Thank you. Yep. Hi, Mary. This is Jim Merritt. Um, I know that Celeste Roy is reading the comb beam CTs for IDEX for us right now. So there's a resource okay. right there. Okay, great. Thank you. Hey, Jamie, this is uh, this is David Sauron. Thank you for this great presentation. I want to um, take in uh, Jim's comments. There, there are several radiologists who are quite comfortable with Condom CT uh, reading. It, it's quite similar to conventional CT with some details um, the resolution on column beam tend to be tends to be um, a bit more significant a little better than conventional CT and contrast uh, is a little different as well maybe not as, as much contrast as you see on conventional CT um, I, I had a question for for you and for, for the rest of the group because I, I see you evolving and I've seen many people now sort of using uh, the vet cat, the condom CT in, in practice. Um, the lesions that you you see now with condom CT compared to those that you couldn't see or maybe were wondering about, um, for instance, the periapical lesions. Um, can you comment on your ability to see them now and and how it might impact your treatment?
Are you, are you asking me, David? Yes. Sure. So I think, you know, one of the areas and, and certainly one of the things that you can read um, in some of the reference articles out there is as far as endodontic treatments for some of these, because we know that if we are considering an endodontic therapy for these teeth that have some sort of apical disease, that our success rates are not as great as if it's not there. And so being able to identify and evaluate that and do the follow-up to be certain of what, what we're seeing down the road, I think is one of the areas where you're going to be more likely to use this versus the teeth that when you're evaluating them on a radiograph or a CT, um, they are very clearly going to be extraction cases. So I, I would say that this may influence the ability to determine whether or not endodontic therapy is, is something to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Well, oh, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Kim. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, any other questions? Okay, if anybody has a follow-up question or wants to get in touch with me, you're certainly welcome to do that. You can reach out to me by email, and I'll just tell you my email address here real quick. It is jamie, J-A-M-I-E, dot burning, it's B as in boy, E-R-N-I-N-G, at M-W-M-V-D dot com. So, and you can also reach out directly to um, Jim Merritt or to David Sarment, and, and they can also forward questions my way if anybody has anything. But with that, thank you, everyone, for coming this evening, and have a great rest of your night. All right, thank Jamie, you. thank you. Thanks a lot. Yep, take Wonderful. care. Bye. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.